speak about the way they should be prepared because no one knows the time, nor do they know when uh, uh, this element will be. Uh, if you go to chapter 20, uh, if you go to uh, if you go to chapter 24, verse 32, Ms. Diamond, if you could read that for us. And in fact, uh, why don't we uh, why don't you use that from verse 14? Chapter 24, verse 14. Yeah, please. <clears throat> and the gospel of the kingdom will be preached throughout the world as a witness to all nations and then the world. The end will come. When you see the abominations broken of broken of through Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, then those in Judea must flee to the mountains. A person on the housetop does not go down to get the Things out of his house. A person in the field must not return to get his cloak. Well, to the pregnant women and nursing mothers in those days, pray that your flight may not be in the winter or on the Sabbath. For at that time there will be a great tribulation such as has not been since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever will be. And if those days had not been shortened, no one will be saved. But for the sake of the elect, they will be shortened. Okay, thank you. And then if you go to verse 29, it says, Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give up and all those things. In other words, those will be some of the things that are that, that will happen. But the question was, when was this going to happen and uh, was going to happen? And uh, the, so-called, the so-called parables on preparedness, basically tell you, you although this may be the signs, yet you do not know for sure when that will be. It's delayed, but yet you do not know what uh, when it will be. If you go to verse 36, if you can read that for, for if you can continue reading from there. <clears throat> but of the day and the hour no one knows, neither the angels of the heaven, nor the sun, but the Father alone. For as it for as it was in the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. In those days before the flood, there were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in, in marriage, up to the day that Noah entered the ark. They did not know until the flood came and carried them away, so will it be at the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be out of the field, one will be taken and one will be left. Two women will be grinding in the mill, one will be taken, one will be left. Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know on which the day the Lord will come. Be sure of this, if the master of the house had known the hour of the night when the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and not let his house be broken into. So too, you also must be prepared, for at that hour you do not know, you do not expect the Son of Man will come. Okay, the, the in this in this uh, in, in this just because the main issue, the main central thing is that of preparedness. That since they do not know when the time will be, they need to be what prepared. They need to be prepared. And there are several parables there that teach you not only about preparedness but also watchfulness. And as I indicated, the idea is that of, uh, the, the, of delayed parousia, uh, and we will look at that in a second. One of the parables that illustrates the, the need for watchfulness is the parable of the ten virgins. The parable of the what? Ten virgins. The ten virgins. That is found in chapter 25. Uh, verse 25. The if you could read that for us, chapter 25, verse 1, and for it. Um, I'm sorry. Chapter 25. 25. Yes, please. First one. Yeah, please. At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five of them were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps but did not take any oil with them. The wise ones, however, took oil and jars along with their lamps. 
the bridegroom was a long time in coming, and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. Okay, and you remember and we are talking. And midnight. Thank, thank you, David. I'll ask you to continue, but um, if we can pause just for a second. There, you remember, there, the idea is that, um, the, is, that, is that of the delay. The first one, when, um, in other words, uh, the, the idea of the delay, and uh, in fact, if you go to verse 5, it tells you, since the bridegroom was long delayed, remember the delayed parousia, they are waiting for the coming of the, they are, they are, they are of the second coming, and they are waiting and they think it is delayed and in the meantime they start to do whatever they oh, they want and they are being told that in the meantime you need to be watchful Please. you need to be you, you need to be what you, you need to be watchful yeah continue reading that please at midnight the cry rang out here's the bridegroom come out to meet him then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps the foolish one said to the wise, Give us some of your oil. Our lamps are going out. No, they replied. There, there may not be enough for the both of us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourself. But while they were on their way to buy oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later, the others also came. Lord, Lord, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, truly I tell you, I don't know you. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour. In other words, it's the question of watchfulness, that in the meantime, as they await, uh, be, what, uh, be prepared. And then another parable that teaches about uh, the need for watchfulness and also preparedness is the parable of the ten talents. Parable of the talents, the parable of the what? The parable of the talents, and uh, that parable of the talents, uh, some were given, some were given, so many others were. In other words, and it has to do with what we do in the meantime as we await for the what? As we await for the coming, um, what do we do in the uh, what do we do in the interim? Uh, what do we do in the interim? <laughs> Anton, could you read that for us, starting from verse fourteen? For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country, who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. And unto one he gave five talents, and another two, and to another one, to every man according to his several ability, and straight way to his journey. Then he that had received the five talents went and traded with the same, and made them other five talents. And likewise he that had received two, he also gained another two. But he that had received one went and digging the earth and hid, it, and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants comes and reckons with them. After a long, so after a long time. time. You remember that, that idea of the a long time is to the delay, delay, the delayed parousia, and you need to remember that. After a long time, okay, go ahead, please. And so he that had received five talents came and brought other five talents, saying, Lord, thou deliverest unto me five talents. Behold, I have gained beside them five talents more. His Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee rule over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. He also that had received two talents came and said, Lord, thou deliverest unto me two talents. Behold, I have gained two other talents. Him. His Lord said unto him, Well done, good, well done, good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. Then he which had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew thee that thou art a hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown, and gathering where thou hast not strewed. And I was afraid, and went and hid thy talent in the earth. Lo, there thou, that, there thou hast that is God. The Lord answered and said unto him, Thou wicked and slothful servant, thou knowest that I reap where I sow not, and gather where I have not strewed. Thou oughtest therefore to have put my money to the exchangers, and then at my coming I should have received my own with piercing. Take therefore the talents from him, and give it unto him which have ten talents. 
For unto everyone that hath shall be given, and he shall have abundance. But from him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he hath. And cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness, there shall be weeping and garnishing of teeth. Okay. When the Son of Man shall come. Okay, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead and finish, please. Okay. Uh, when the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of the glory. Okay. The, the, uh, no, no, up to there. Thank you. The main issue is that um, in the, many had started becoming religious and they were doing whatever they wanted because they thought the, uh, they thought the parishioner was delayed. And he's telling them, in the meantime, you may, you need to be doing something. You need to be, in other words, you cannot just do whatever you want. You, be, you, may need, you should be doing something, and you should be doing something that is constructive. If you go back to the page, um, the page that has all the, page 155 that has all the, uh, the outline of the, all the discourses, we have looked at uh, the five discourses. The first one, as we indicated, was the Sermon on the Mount. The second one was the Mission of the Disciples. The third one was the Parables of the Kingdom. The third one is Forgiveness and the Community. And then finally, we looked at the, the teachings about the end of time, which we indicated the main issue there is the, uh, is the question of the delayed parousia. But in the meantime, Matthew... Uh, Matthew reminds the community to, so to speak, to be prepared and uh, and to also be watchful. And he gives illustrations and he gives examples of that watchfulness by giving them the parable of the ten virgins, as well as the, 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 the uh, as well as the parable of the of the of the talent. And um, the those summarize. The, the so-called the five discourses, but those five discourses are interspersed with sections of narrative. They are interspersed with sections of narrative. We will not go, we will not look at those, uh, the narrative, but um, as you read that chapter and as you review that whole chapter, you need to go through the narrative the narrative, uh, the, the narrative, but Matthew is one that it has passed both the narrative with the discourse, and those are mixed, are mixed together. Are there any questions uh, so far? Are there any questions regarding uh, regarding what we have covered so far? No. Sir. Uh, no. Okay. If you go to, um, if you go to page one seventy one. Of the textbook, uh, it has to do with the end of time or the coming of the end, and that's the one that we ended with. And uh, you need to go over that and look at it. And then chapter eight, if you turn to page one seventy-seven of your textbook, page one seventy-seven of your textbook, it deals with uh, the gospel according to Luke. In other words, uh, we have looked at Mark's Gospel, we finished looking at uh, Matthew's Gospel, now we're going to look at both, Acts of, uh, both Luke's Gospel and Acts of the Apostles. And if you go to the top of that page, there are issues regarding the authorship of Luke's Gospel. According to the textbook, uh, who was the author of Luke's Gospel? Traditionally, who was the author of uh, Luke's Gospel? Mm -hmm. um, look on page one seventy-seven, all the way at the top. It'll, it'll tell you who the author who the author was traditionally. Hmm? You say Paul, but uh, it's not Paul. It doesn't say Paul there. The position and a campaign. Traditionally, oh, as a, uh, traditionally associated with who? Luke, Luke. and a companion, a companion, a companion of uh, Paul. In other words, it's not written by Paul, but it was written by Luke, who was um, believed to be a physician, 
and also a companion, a companion of um, oh. of Paul. And uh, the Rook's Gospel is written particularly to is one of the most universal of, of all the Gospels. Luke's Gospel is the most universal of all the Gospels. What I'd like to do is, because we'll be dealing with both Luke's Gospel and Acts of the Apostles, because both were written by the same, I uh, believe to have been written by the same person. What I'd like to do before we go for lunch, uh, before we go to lunch, let alone, um, I would like for us to look at the. I would like for us to look at the. Uh, introduce ourselves to uh, Luke's Gospel, and we will come to Acts of the Apostles also very briefly. If you turn to your textbook on page one seventy eight, your textbook on page one seventy eight. Excuse me. Yeah. Who did you say wrote Luke? You said Luke wrote Luke. Let us look on page, uh, we, that's what we are going to look at on page 178. But if you go to your, okay. but if you go to your textbooks on page 177, under the overview, can you read the first bullet, can you read the first bullet there for us? Who, oh, me? Yes. The, oh. the first bullet on uh, the page. Traditionally associated with Luke, a physician and companion of Paul, probably a Gentile Christian who knew the Septuagint. Greek translation. The Septuagint. Yeah. Yeah, Septuagint. Yeah. That's it. Okay, and then if you turn to your textbook also, if you turn to your textbook on page one seventy eight. Page 178, you have a section in the middle of the page entitled Authorship. And um, the, and, and the uh, Authorship, and if you go to the bottom of the page, if you go to the bottom of the, uh, if you go to the bottom of that page, um, Miss Henry, if you could read that for us, all the way at the bottom of page 178, where it starts with, like, the authors of the Gospels of Mark and Matthew. Like the authors of the Gospels of Mark and Matthew, the writer of this Gospel does not give his name. Irenaeus. Irenaeus, a theologian of the early church, is among the first to associate this Gospel with Luke. The 4th century church historian... You say this. Records his words as follows. Luke also, the follower of Paul, put down in the book of the gospel preached by that one. The New Testament three references to a man named Luke who was a companion of Paul have led some scholars to conclude that Luke was a physician and a Gentile Christian. Okay. Then... In other words, uh, most scholars believe uh, when you go to the uh, to those citations, Philemon twenty four, Colossians chapter four verse eleven, and Second Timothy chapter four, they all refer to a man by Luke who was also a physician and also a companion of Paul. And according to church tradition, it is believed that um, it is believed that that Luke may have been the author of the textbook. The argument then was that many of them argued that uh, he was a physician and uh, knew, knew about healing, knew about medicine. But most scholars today have argued, no, uh, he could not, uh, when you look at Luke's gospel, his knowledge of uh, medicine is not more than any of uh, you find in Mark or Matthew or any of the other gospels. And... Um, any who any person who was educated during the time could have the same knowledge as we know it today. In other words, most modern scholars, uh, although the early church tradition argued it was written by Luke, who was a physician, modern scholars have rejected that and have said it was written anonymously because we do not know who wrote it. Because the gospel itself does not indicate who wrote it, we only find it. 
uh, we uh, it, it does not. It, it's only the church tradition that says it might have been written by Luke, who was of Asia. The only thing that uh, we find particularly that is internal is that um, Luke's gospel indicates that uh, whoever the other was, whoever the other was, uh, depended on eyewitnesses, depended on eyewitnesses. Witnesses. In other words, he believes that there were others who wrote the gospel, uh, who had started to write the gospel, and therefore Luke's gospel is not the first one to write. Uh, it is, Luke is not the first person to write, but there are others who have attempted to write, and he himself is trying to write what he believes is a true narrative, and which has made many scholars to believe that Luke was attempting to write history the way historians wrote though, during those times. Whether it was objective or not is another issue, and we'll look at that in a second. But uh, Luke at, was attempting to write what he felt was history. Could um, Solomon, could you read chapter uh, Luke's Gospel, chapter one, verse one, yep. from verse one? Yeah. For as much, <clears throat> for as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us, even as they delivered them unto us which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word. It seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write unto thee in order most excellent, Theopolis. Okay, in other words, in Luke's Gospel, we find that the author uh, has uh, knows of others who are trying to write, but he himself is trying to write what he feels is an accurate, uh, an accurate narrative of all, all the things that happened uh, of all the things that happened to Jesus, and uh, he and the book itself is also dedicated to a man by name of Theophilus. Is dedicated to who? Theophilus. The, we do not know who Theophilus was. We do not, but the name itself means uh, Theo, God, Philus, uh, lover of God. In other words, pers a person who loved who? A person who loved God. Uh, we uh, and. Um, Many scholars believe he could have been a, a Roman citizen uh, or a Roman official. And basically, Rook's gospel is trying to say to write to him as a patron and telling him, yes, we as Christians are not as harmful as you pretend we are. In other words, the book is dedicated to the Theophilus. But we don't know for sure he, who he was, but many people speculate that he could have been a, a Roman what? He could be have been a Roman official. He could have been, because he is addressed there as... Uh, uh, he, how is he addressed there? How did you read it? The Ophiraz is addressed in an official capacity as well. Perfect understanding. No. Look at the way it says, the, oh, the, the Ophiraz is addressed as... Uh, as the in, in an official capacity, mm -hmm. what how is he addressed uh, in an official capacity? There, look at your Bible, mm -hmm. chapter 1, verse the way he's addressed, it. Excellent. your excellence. Yes, he's addressed as an excellence, as your excellence mm -hmm. of uh, the Ophiras, which has made uh, led many scholars to believe that he could have been an official, he could have been a a Roman official who held a position. The Bible does not tell us that, but uh, that's the speculation that we hear from many scholars. When you go to Acts of the Apostles, when you go to what? Right. When you go to the Acts of the Apostles, you see that uh, both Acts of the Apostles and Luke's Gospel were written by the same person. Can you turn to Acts chapter 1 verse 1? Can you go to Acts chapter 1 verse 1? Acts of the Apostles, chapter 1, verse 1. Cassandra, if you can read that for us. Acts chapter 1, verse 1. Theophilus. I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and 
the teach. In such a day, he was taken up to heaven. After giving instructions to the Holy Spirit, to the apostles, he had chosen. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you. But um, here he has a reference to my former what? In my former book. In my former book. And he also mentions that you remember in Acts, in Luke's Gospel, chapter 1, verse 1 and following, we have also Theophilus, who is said uh, the book is dedicated to Theophilus. And then when you go to Acts, uh, Acts of the Apostles, he is referring to my former what? My former book, which means that there is a connection between Acts of the Apostles and Luke's Gospel, and they are believed to have been written by the same word. They are believed to have been written because both of them are dedicated to the same person, and who is that person? They are both. They are both. They are both addressed. Uh, they are both dedicated or addressed to the Ophirus. and um, in uh, Acts of the Apostles. It says in my former book, uh, in my former book, uh, and he then, in summary, tells him what he attempted to do to write about Jesus Christ and all that had happened to him. Which means that many scholars have seen that there is a connection between uh, the Acts of the Apostles and Luke's Gospel. And whoever wrote, the, uh, wrote both books, and uh, the person who wrote Acts of the Apostles, Therefore, was the same person who wrote Luke's Gospel. Are there any connection? Are there any questions regarding the authorship? Gwyneth, uh, are there any questions regarding the connection between Acts of the Apostles and Luke's Gospel? No question from Gwyneth. Yeah, okay, okay, what about Savannah? So, okay. okay. What about uh, Chesapeake. Good. You're good, okay. In other words, the author of Acts of the Apostles is regarded to be the same author as Luke's Gospel because both of them are referred to, uh, are, are dedicated to Theophilus. Not only are they dedicated to Theophilus, but also, but also Acts of the Apostles says about a former, a former work, which means that Acts of the Apostles is basically a second volume of the first volume, which is Acts of, uh, which is Luke's Gospel. Are there any questions so far? Okay. Then, if you go to, if you go to your textbook, if you go to your textbook on page one seventy nine, if you go to page one seventy nine. Um, where it starts with biblical scholars have wondered whether Luke was gentle as the tradition has suggested or Jewish. You see that in your textbook? Those who argue that he was Jewish do so because his writings contain numerous references to the Old Testament Septuagint. However, he would necessarily have been a, a Hellenistic Jew who received a training in one of the urban centers of learning around the Mediterranean. If he was gentle, perhaps he was one of the God-fearers, and, uh, and it, then it continues. But the main issue here, if you go to the bottom of the page, where it starts in some books, gospel might have been written anonymously. You see that? Uh, because it, we, do not, we do not have, we do not have any, uh, we don't know for sure who might have written it. Um, then on page 180, the question is when was Bo was the Gospel of Luke written, and um, when does uh, what date does the other suggest? What date does the other suggest? Between the yes, and uh, and what 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 does what does he base that on? What does he base that date on? The same time as Matthew thought. Yeah. The same time as uh, Matthew, uh, uh, the same time as, as Matthew. And um, he bases that on the fact that uh, he refers in the gospel itself that uh, the others had attempted to write 
And he also says that the, whatever he's writing is not first hand information. He's basing his ideas on eyewitnesses. <coughs> Did you get that? Because that will be on the test and you need to remember that. He bases his information on eye, eye, eye what? On eyewitnesses. So therefore, therefore, it is not first hand information. It is information about the eye, is eyewitness, is eyewitness information. When you go to Luke's Gospel, you discover that his style is similar to that of the historians of the period. The style of Luke's Gospel is follows almost the style of the writers, historians of what? Of his time. However, it is not uh, his writing is not uh, he is not objective history. You know what objective history is today. What is objective history? When we say that he doesn't write objectively, what are we saying? Objectively, yes. Objective history in today's uh, standards is history that uh, you remember like if I were to ask you to write a paper I would also ask you to cite properly I would uh, you never You never go and uh, the story never becomes you and in other words you don't become subjective Like you you're not telling me about yourself. You are basically analyzing material uh, in other words, you don't even turn to I or we or any of those things because it is objective. Uh, uh, you analyze the material as much, uh, you analyze the material as objectively as you can. However, when you look at uh, Mark, Luke's Gospel, the, both Luke and, and Acts of the Apostles, the writer will turn to passages that are usually called the we passages. The, the what? Where the, where the other of the where the other becomes part of the story, where the other becomes part of the work, uh, and although Luke's Gospel as well as Acts of the Apostles follows the methods of writing papers that were done during the first century, yet they do not follow the methods we use today, which uh, you, where you do not uh, the, uh, the the writer does not become part of the work. Part of the story it does it does not become part of the part of the story, but you will find that uh, Matthew, uh, Luke's gospel, uh, or whoever he uh, or whoever he was, was a person who knew that the, the method of uh, the historical method of writing. He also knew the geography of his time, and uh, he also knew the Greek language very well. When we were looking at Mark's Gospel, we indicated that Mark's Gospel has the poorest Greek. Uh, I don't remember for sure whether, I think I men mentioned that in class, that Mark's Gospel, the, the grammar wasn't all that good, but in Luke's Gospel, the grammar is, he has one of the best grammar that you can find in the New Testament. And not only does he have I said Luke knew Greek. Very well. And he writes very well. He writes Greek very well, and he also not only knows that, but also he knew even Greek philosophy. And there are times when, for example, he will quote, he will quote from, uh, he will quote from it. There are times when he will quote from Greek what? He will quote from Greek philosophy. No, but not only did he know Greek philosophy, he also knew, he, he also knew the the Jewish faith. He also knew the Jewish faith. Which means that he combines both. He also combines what? Both. He, which means that he knew the yeah. Greek. He knew the Greek Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, and he knew how to use it very well. He basically believed, became a good bridge. He became a good what? Bridge. Because Jesus had spoken. Jesus had spoken in in, in Aramaic. And this guy is able to get those ideas that Jesus spoke in Aramaic and be able to translate them into Greek and do it do it very well. <coughs> Did you get that? Yeah. Jesus spoke in what language? Arabic. But uh, the but the gospel itself is written in what language? 
Greek. And Luke is able, both in Acts of the Apostles and in Luke, and in the Gospel itself, to be able to translate, to make that bridge between Aramaic and, and Greek. And he is able to do that and do it, do it very well. Are there any questions uh, so far? Okay. Uh, the, if you turn to your Bibles, uh, if you turn to your Bibles to chapter 1 of Luke's Gospel, from the beginning you have what is called the prologue. What is called the what? The prologue is basically the introduction. That is chapter 1, verse 1 through 3. And in that introduction, Luke will in fact introduce the leader to, to what he is attempting to do. And he says, and he says, since many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the events that have been fulfilled among us, just as those who are, who are eyewitnesses from the beginning and ministers of the world have handed them down to us, I too have decided, after investigating everything accurately and new, to write it down in an orderly, in an orderly, in an orderly sequence for you. In other words, Luke's gospel attempts is trying to write history. He is attempting to write what? He is attempting to write history and as accurately as he can. And in Luke's gospel, as well as Acts of the Apostles, you see a lot of, uh, when, for example, he speaks about the birth of Jesus Christ, he will connect it with a date. He, in other words, the, he will connect it with a date so that... Uh, Whoever is reading it can be able to connect it. When Jesus is crucified, the gospel according to Luke will tell you it was during the time of Pontius Pilate so that you can associate the death of Jesus with a, with a given time. And he is attempting to write history, but as I indicated, he's not trying to write objective history the way we do it today. Are we together so far? Okay. Then... If you turn to page 182 of the textbook, if you turn to page 180, what? If you turn to page 182 of the textbook, you remember when we were looking at um, Matthew's Gospel, we indicated Matthew's Gospel is, Jew, is the most Jewish of all the Gospels. In fact, in, uh, in, fact, in Matthew's Gospel, uh, chapter 10, when the disciples were sent out, they were sent, whom we did dealt with that this morning, but to whom were they sent? Whom were the disciples in, in, Mark, in Matthew's Gospel sent to? Remember they were sent to the lost, to the lost tribes of what? Israel. They were, in other words, they were sent to the Jewish people. Matthew's gospel is the most universal of all the Matthew's gospel is the most universal of all the what? Uh, Matthew's gospel is the most universal of all the gospels. Huh. Is that Matthew or Luke? It, it means it means my brain is is short circuited. Let me go back. Luke's gospel is the most universal of all the what? Yeah, I meant, uh, therefore I meant, I meant uh, Luke's Gospel. Luke's Gospel is the most universal of all the Gospels. And there are several ways in which Luke's Gospel attempts to illustrate the universality of the Gospel. There are ways in which Luke's Gospel attempts to illustrate the universality of the world. The, the universality of Christianity. First... Christianity is socially universal, and you need to remember that. First, Christianity is socially what? Christianity is socially universal, and there are many passages. And I will, we, when after we come from break, we we'll go over many of those passages to illustrate how Christianity is universal. First, Christianity is socially universal. Are we together? So far, secondly, Christianity is geographically universal. Secondly, Christianity is socially what? 
And then thirdly and finally, Christianity is historically universal. Rem Let me go over those again. We indicated, uh, we first of all said Christianity was what? Socially, Socially what? Universal. Socially universal. Secondly, it was geographically universal. And thirdly, it was what? Historically universal. Let's start with the first one where the, we indicated that Christianity is socially what? When you go to Luke's Gospel, as well as Acts of the Apostles, Acts of the Apostles, there is what is called you, uh, the origin of reversal. The origin of what? The origin of reversal. And by the origin of reversal, what uh, the author of our textbook refers to is that those groups that were marginalized, those groups that were what? In Luke's gospel, they are socially uplifted. Those groups, uh, the theology of reversal, where those groups that were marginally, marginally, marginally what? Marginally excluded, are now, now become what? Now become, uh, they are embraced in Luke's gospel. There are certain groups that were marginalized. There are certain groups in uh, there are certain groups in Jewish society that were ma were marginalized, such as women, such as what? Women in Jewish society, women were never regarded as anything. In Luke's gospel, women are lifted. Women are what? One of the examples is in the story of Mary. Mary, when Mary was at, um, when Mary was told by the angel Gabriel that she was going to be the mother of Jesus, she in fact went and met with her cousin Elizabeth. And in her response to Elizabeth, she gives what is called the Magnificat, which we will be looking at later on, and in which she praises God for what God has done. She says, from here henceforth, people will call me blessed. In other words, in Jewish society, women were never regarded as anything, but now the coming of Jesus has, so, so to speak, lifted who? Women. In Luke's Gospel also, uh, there are so many women who are mentioned more than any of the other Gospels. A lot, more, a lot of women who are mentioned more than any of the other words. And their roles are reversed because in the in Jewish society, women were never. Con I don't know how our society regards women. How how does our society regard women? Are they regarded uh, with respect, or how are they? How do how are the women in general regarded? You're all quiet. I, I, would, I would say with respect, mm -hmm. but still not not. On the same level as a man. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, and in Jewish society it was even worse. In Je Jewish society it was even worse, and uh, we will review some of those things a little on this afternoon. But uh, but women were among the marginalized groups within Jewish society. Another uh, and in Luke's gospel also the poor. The poor are also the uh, the poor were also the the poor are also marginalized. In Luke's gospel, when Jesus speaks about what his mission was, he says the spirit of God is upon me to preach the good news, and he refers to one of the groups that he in fact he mentions is uh, the poor. Are uh, the what? And in uh, in Jewish uh, in um, in Luke's gospel, the poor are given a very high. Those who are poor, in fact, it speaks about those who are rich, going empty hand, uh, going empty handed, and those, so to speak, who are poor, becoming elevated. You have the story, for example, of um, uh, Lazarus. And the rich, uh, Lazarus, who was a poor man, 
And when they go to heaven, their the roles are reversed. It is uh, the rich man. The rich man become the one who is go, who is begging. Rather, rather, rather. In other words, the roles. Uh, you remember the theology of reversal that I mentioned earlier. The poor now become the first become the 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 first become the last, and the last become first. the first. And the poor are given a very high uh, a very high place, particularly in Max uh, in uh, in Luke's gospel. We have so far looked at uh, how the gospel is, or Christianity is, socially universal because those social groups, in terms of social stratification, that were regarded, regarded as marginalized, now become what? Now they become uplifted. Also, the Gentiles, the non-Jews, there were the Jews were very exclusivistic. The Jews of the time of Jesus were very what? Exclusivistic. They regarded Gentiles as well as others as dogs. <laughs> but uh, in the gospel of in the gospel of Luke, the Gentiles or non what or non Jews are now accepted. In fact, the gospel is to all people. It's not only to the Jewish people, but it's all to all world. To all, to all people. Jesus came so that those who were not regarded as a people could be regarded as a people. And if you go to your textbook, that chapter that you are reading, it is used also by liberation theologians here in the United States and elsewhere. For example, black Black theologians here in the United States use it because they can identify with it because of the way it speaks about Jesus reversing the world. Jesus reversing the world. Okay, but the main point is that the gospel is socially what? Socially universal. And what I was giving you are a few of the examples and many, there are many other examples that you can find in the gospel itself. Secondly, the gospel is also geographically universal. Remember, we indicated that the gospel was also geographically what? The geographically universal. The, in the gospel of Luke, it starts in Jerusalem. And many of the chapters in, in the gospel of Luke start in Jerusalem. They start in where? But also Christianity spreads geographically from Jerusalem to other areas. From Jerusalem to other world, to other areas. And you will find both in Acts of the Apostles, as well as Luke's Gospel itself, how Christianity spreads, uh, spreads, uh, spreads geographically. It will start in, the teachings of Jesus will start in Jerusalem, but they will go to Samaria, from the, they will go to Judea, from Judea to Samaria, from uh, from Judea uh, from Samaria to to, uh, to Syria, and then to all the corners of the world. In fact, in in Mark uh, in in Acts of the Apostles, the activities of the church will start in Jerusalem, and they will end up by going all the way uh, throughout the world, which means that there is. A geographical progression of the world. There's a geographical progression of there's a geographical progression of the of, of, of Christianity. So far, I have indicated two things. Christianity is socially universal. Secondly, Christianity is geographically what? Universal. 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 And, and then the third thing is Christianity is historically universal. And you need to remember that. Christianity is uh, historically what? And there are illustrations in the Gospel as well as Acts of the Apostles that attempt to illustrate that. The first one is the genealogy. The genealogy in Luke's Gospel attempts to explain that Christianity is historically what? Historically universal. In fact, in, Acts, uh, in fact, in 
Brooks Gospel, the genealogy itself goes does not go all the way back to Abraham as the one in Matthew does, but it also goes all the way to Adam. Goes back all the way to who? It goes back all the way to Adam. And when we go come this afternoon and look at the textbook, we'll be looking at some of those things. But uh, in other words, the genealogy does not go back to Abraham, who is Jewish, but goes way to Adam, who is believed to be the father of all who are human beings. Not only that, but also Luke's gospel, as well as Acts of the Apostles. Luke believes that salvation history, salvation salvation work, mm -hmm. is divided into three epochs. And you need to remember that. Salvation history is divided into how many epochs? Three. Epochs or periods. Period. Periods? Yeah. It's divided into three ep ep epochs. Those three epochs, the first one is one from the time of the prophets to the time of John the Baptist. From the time of, from the time of John the uh, of the prophets to the time of who? Of who? John the Baptist. You know, John the Baptist. And that's salvation history in Luke, uh, in, in the Luke and material in Luke, Luke as well as Acts. And then the second period is that of Jesus Christ, as we find it particularly in Luke's Gospel. The second period is what? Right. The time of Jesus as we find it in as we find it where? <coughs> in Luke's Gospel. And then the third period is that of the period of the church, uh, which is found in Acts of the Apostles. Which is found in, which is found in what? In Acts of the Apostles. In, in other words, there is, uh, the salvation history also is one that, uh, and when it may start with the Jewish people, but it ends with Jesus proclaiming the gospel to all what? To all, pe to all people. To all people. We will review the textbook when we come back. The third epoch was the period of the church. The period of the which is found in Acts of the Apostles. Okay, let me go over those three periods again. And remember, we are looking at the church being historically what universal. Even salvation is divided into how many periods? The first period is the pro the period of the prophets in the Old Testament, coming all the way and ending with John, John the Baptist. And then the second period is that is the period of the world. Right. Jesus Christ, as we find it, as we find it, as we find it where? In Luke's gospel. And then and then finally you have the and then finally you have what? You have the period of the church as it is found in Acts of the World. As uh, as you find it in, in in Acts of the Apostles. If you go to your textbooks on page 182, if you go to your textbooks on page 182, many of the things that we have basically gone over are also found there. In other words, they are summarized, they are summarized there, and we'll go over some of those, uh, and we, we'll go over those, uh, what was that, Timo, that you're doing? Okay. She needed number one. We will start her with number one. Okay. If you go to your textbook on page 182, it basically summarizes many of the things that we are indicating about uh, about Christianity or Christianity being un uh, being universal. And you remember we indicated that it is uh, socially universal. Secondly, we indicated that it was what. Geographically universal, and finally, it, it was historically what? It was historically universal, and we attempted to 
go through those things and when we come back from lunch when we come back from lunch we'll go over those things so that uh, you can know where to locate them in the text to locate them in the in the textbook and um, you know where to locate them in the textbook is um, is uh, 1236 we need to go for we need to go for break and if you can be back by Hello, hello, hello. 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 When when you move, it makes it is when you move, it makes yeah, it is outside, yeah. Okay. It is twelve. It is twelve twenty. Uh, it's it's twelve thirty six now, and we need to be back by one fifteen. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Have a wonderful. Centennial, is that the one? Uh, where's Centennial? Hold on. 